Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Matthew has a monster inside him. Grr. <laughs> Grr. It's a big old bear. Grr, arg. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown. Across the table is uh, our big old bear, Matthew Stockton. BG bear. BG bear. BGB. Well, big, oh, well. Big gay bear. Big gay bear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In our last episode, we learned about the life and first two murders of British serial murderer Dennis Andrew Nielsen. He was arrested after police discovered human remains he'd flushed down the toilet at 23 Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, a suburb of North London. In this episode, we'll learn about Nielsen's next 12 murders, what happened after his arrest, and the aftermath of his crimes. A number of Nielsen's victims remain unidentified to this day. As Dennis Nilsson was a necrophile, some of the information we are about to share is intense and may be very disturbing to some. Listener discretion is strongly advised. You're listening to Dark Poutine episode 229, Lonely Monster, Serial Killer, Dennis Nilsson, part 3. Before we start, I noticed a boo-boo in last week's audio. At one point I said the address that Nielsen had lived at was 95 Melrose Avenue. It was actually 195 Melrose. There goes your journalist license, Mike. I didn't have one to begin with, (laughs) nor do I deserve one. (laughs) People seem to think that, you know, we should be held to the same standards, same journalistic standards. Hey, you know what, guys? Mm. For those who think it, yeah, become a Patreon. Yeah, exactly. And and And, and and then we can have an entire team of researchers. Yeah, (laughs) right. After 23-year-old Canadian engineering student Kenneth Ockenden's murder, Dennis Andrew Nielsen went into a cooling-off period. According to Scott A. Bond, Ph.D., in an article on psychologytoday.com, quote, From a social-psychological perspective, the emotional cooling-off period between the murders is a key behavioral characteristic that distinguishes serial killers from all other types of murderers. End quote. The period of time varies between different offenders and can also vary with some killers, while others appear to kill at more regular intervals. Dr. Bond goes on to say that, quote, The cooling off period is important because it constitutes a time out from murder for a serial killer. During the cooling off period between murders, a serial killer disappears from the public eye and resumes his or her seemingly normal routine and life. 
Incredibly, the life of a serial killer during the cooling off period, particularly if he or she is a psychopathic killer like Ted Bundy or Gary Ridgway, that is, pathologically devoid of emotion or empathy, may appear completely normal to the unsuspecting observer. This was so for Dennis Nielsen. He just went back to work, and those acquainted with him hadn't a clue about the dark deeds he was involved in. Vaughn continues, The cooling off period is to a serial killer what coming down from a narcotic high is to a drug addict. It is a time of rest and recomposure. The cooling off period is only a temporary time out, however. So is this like uh, serial killer self-care? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's Okay, yeah. <laughs> Soon enough, the serial killer will need another victim, just as the heroin addict will eventually need another fix or the alcoholic will need another drink to calm their cravings, end quote. Into the spring of 1980, Dennis Nielsen's fantasies had ramped up again, and as a result, his obsession with finding his next victim invaded his mind, becoming paramount to all other pursuits. His next victim was a 16-year-old catering student named Martin Duffy from the Birkenhead neighborhood of Liverpool. Martin, like many of Dennis Nielsen's victims, was troubled and vulnerable. Even before he went missing, Martin's parents were worried about him. According to Brian Masters in Killing for Company, quote, He had a troubled childhood with marked signs of instability, theft, running away from home, threatening behavior, end quote. At a young age, Doctors, social workers, and psychiatrists were employed to help him deal with his psychological problems. For a time, he attended a school for maladjusted children. He briefly worked as a trainee salesman and had taken a catering course, but overall he struggled with life. According to Masters, Martin was a frequent visitor to Liverpool's gay clubs and he was introduced to Valium there and developed a nasty addiction to the drug. Martin started dating a girl and spent a lot of time with her, but soon he was on the run again. On May 13, 1980, he'd packed his sharpened catering knives into a beat-up old suitcase, told his parents he was moving to New Brighton, and left. They never saw him again. Interesting. Have you seen the TV show, um, It's a Sin? No, I have not seen that. It's on Amazon Prime here in Canada, I think. Okay, yeah. So one of the characters there, um, what I think might be happening here is Martin probably wasn't dating a girl. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have been. Right. But probably had a female friend to say, and said he was dating her to get his parents off of his back. Ah. Right? Um, okay. Happened, happened a lot back then, mm -hmm. right? I think that's maybe what was going on there. Okay. Yeah, know. that makes sense. I mean... A lot of societal and family pressure around being gay. Yeah, back then especially. Yeah. Yeah. Martin had ridden the train for a time, sleeping in the train stations along the way. When questioned about his ticket, which he did not have, was booted from the train by its conductor. Martin hitchhiked the rest of the way to London, his true destination. So there you go. F fake a girlfriend and then head to Mecca. So... <laughs> Mecca, you mean gay Mecca of London, right? Yeah, yeah mm. essentially. Okay. You know, a lot of young gay kids go to the, the big city. Sure. Right? Because Vancouver is a, a popular destination. Bigger community. Yeah. Yeah. On his way home from a business conference, Dennis Nielsen spotted Martin Duffy at Euston train station in London on May 17, 1980. Dennis was immediately smitten and knew Martin would be an easy mark. Dennis did his best version of the caring, nice guy routine, chatting with the youngster. On finding out Martin was tired and hungry, Dennis invited him back to his place at 195 Melrose Avenue in Cricklewood for food and a place to rest. Martin accepted, probably relieved by the stranger's kindness. So this kid mm -hmm. is literally just off the train. Pretty much, yeah. And, and Nielsen swoops in. Yeah. Didn't even have a chance to set himself up in London. Nope. It's incredible. They ate, and after drinking two cans of beer, Martin, exhausted, fell asleep on Nielsen's bed. Dennis was excited by Martin's youthful appearance. Nielsen drank some more, summoning his courage to make his next move. Dennis positioned himself astride Martin Duffy and strangled him with his necktie. Noticing Martin was still alive, but barely, Nielsen dragged the boy into his kitchen, filled the sink with water, and held Martin there until the bubbles stopped. Nielsen had again recreated the scene of the drowning boy that had first turned him on so many years ago. 
Nielsen has such a specific fetish, mm -hmm. like so specific, which un which unfortunately includes somebody dying. Yeah. Right? Like it's such At a, this case, I think it's called a paraphilia. Is that what it's called? Yeah. I but, mean, it's too bad he just couldn't be turned on by like red high heels or something. Right? Mm -hmm. I think a paraphilia is anything that involves someone being injured or inappropriate okay. behavior in a way. So another instance of paraphilia is peakerism. Do you know what that is? No. So essentially peakerism is someone being turned on by piercing somebody else's skin. Okay. I thought it was peaking on somebody. No. Okay. <laughs> like peak. Okay. P-I-Q. Okay. Uh, Q-U-E. Q yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and that apparently simulates sex, the entering and exiting okay. of the body. I mean, it's just so specific. Mm -hmm. And it's just so screwed up. According to Alan R. Warren's Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, Nielsen kept Duffy's body for two days. He either sat him upright in the armchair conversing with the dead body or laid him on his bed where he would kiss, fondle, and masturbate on the stomach of the corpse. Before he left for work each day, he would place the body in a cupboard, end quote. Nielsen then placed Martin's corpse under the floorboards near Kenneth Ockenden's body. Nielsen has no sense of the value or the sanctity of life. No. Like, it, 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 he just completely dehumanizes, mm -hmm. like him, completely shuts off to the fact that they're living human beings. Essentially, after he murders these men and boys, many, the ones he fantasized most about were boys. More boys. As soon as he's done that, they become like a sex doll to him. Yeah. They're a toy. That's it. That's, that's the amount of care and consideration he puts into it. Wow, he was one piece of work, man. Mm -hmm. After the smell of decomposition became too strong to ignore, Dennis used Martin's own knives to dissect his body and that of Kenneth Ockenden on the kitchen floor. Dennis then packed the body parts wrapped in black garbage bags into old suitcases and put them in the garden shed where they remained for the next six months. Dennis then later burned the bodies in a bonfire. Dennis let Martin's knives rust before throwing them away, hoping no one would take notice of them. That, you know, that, that makes me really sad. I, I knew somebody that um, was training to be a chef mm -hmm. and had this, like, was so excited about this the set of lovely knife set yeah. in this um, leather sort of rolling thing. And it, it, it was a symbol. For me, I'm seeing this as a symbol of this kid, like, the opportunity in life and to train to do something and move forward. Mm -hmm. And and he... and. It's just used to cut them apart and he lets them rust. It's just, I don't know, that just sort of hit me in a weird way. Right, yeah. yeah. Me too. In early August 1980, after meeting Dennis Nielsen at the Golden Lion Pub, a man named Douglas Stewart had a close call with Dez at 195 Melrose Avenue. After a drink, Stewart had rebuffed Dennis's advances and said he just needed some rest. Dennis, again, kept drinking, and when he thought Stewart was asleep, attempted to strangle the man with his own tie. Douglas fought and bested Dennis, ending up sitting on Nielsen's chest. Nielsen begged for his life, yelling, Take my money! Most likely setting himself up for the alibi he would later give police, who visited after Stewart reported Dennis Nielsen. Dennis once again told the officers that the occurrence had been a misunderstanding, an argument between lovers, as it were. Police left the matter at that and took no further action. Do you think if it was a man and a woman and the guy just says, oh, it was just a misunderstanding, that they'd go, okay? No, nope, I don't think they would go, okay. Something would have happened. Yeah. Yep. So there's um, institutional homophobia happening here. Totally. There's a bias. Undeterred by the near miss... Dennis still had to satisfy his urge to kill again. He couldn't be as picky as he had been previously. He really needed a fix. Scotsman and hard-drinking William Billy Sutherland, 26, fit the bill. Sutherland was intermittently a sex worker, having sex with men for money and known as a rent boy. Sutherland was bisexual and had a steady girlfriend, Donna, with whom he had a daughter. He'd been in and out of reform school and prisons. According to Masters and Killing for Company, Billy was covered in tattoos and had love and hate on the fingers of his hands. Classics. To Nilsson, Billy was a placeholder, something to tide him over 
until he could get what he really wanted. Billy was too old and really didn't fit Nilsen's fantasies. Dennis, who was very drunk during the murder, couldn't recall much about the events around Billy's slaying. Other than that, he'd strangled Sutherland with a tie, straddling him, and had awakened beside the body the next morning. Like the others, he bathed Billy and performed necrophilic acts with the body afterward. Billy's body would for a time be stuffed in the floorboards, and he'd later be burned in one of Dennis's backyard bonfires. Mm. Billy Sutherland's girlfriend became worried after not hearing from him for several days. Up to that point, he'd been good about staying in contact with her and their daughter. It wasn't until after hearing of Dennis Nielsen's arrest in 1983 that Donna thought her Billy had been one of Nielsen's many unidentified victims. She gave a picture of Billy to police, who then showed the photo to Nielsen. Nielsen admitted that Billy Sutherland had been his fourth murder victim. Dennis Nielsen's next seven victims, killed between 1980 and 1982, remain unidentified. He never bothered to learn their names. Again, they were all props in his sick fantasies. They weren't people in his mind. There is no information we have to impart other than that given by Nielsen himself. Dez had effectively erased all of them. However, there are seven families out there somewhere who probably miss these men and boys. As Nielsen burned the bodies, it's not likely that there is any DNA remaining to help identify these victims. We'll list the victims with brief bits of information that may help to one day identify them, but it's been out there a while and hasn't done so yet. Over the next few months, the cooling off period between murders shortened, giving the impression that Dez's addiction to murder was progressing quickly. Alan R. Warren laid out the victims in order in his book, Drinks, Dinner, and Death. The details of each are taken from there, essentially. Murder victim number five. In September of 1980, Nilsen claimed that he remembered very little about this man who he claimed he met at the Cricklewood Arms pub. Dennis thought the man was between 27 and 30, but couldn't be sure. Dennis said that he recalled the man had an Irish accent and rough hands from the work he supposedly did. The man had been treated in the way the others had, strangled, washed, and kept for a time, later disposed of in the usual fashion via dismemberment and burning. In a strange twist, Nielsen later recanted this confession, saying he made this victim up and that the man had never existed. Murder victim number six. A month later in October, Nielsen met another victim at the Salisbury Arms pub. He later identified this man as perhaps 20 years old, but as much as 30, and a rent boy. He said the man might have been Filipino or Mexican. He couldn't be sure. This victim was around 5 foot 10 inches tall, slender, with, quote, gypsy-like features. Again, Dennis lured the man back to his lair with his usual offers of money and drinks. Nielsen claimed he couldn't remember anything about the murder of this man. Murder victim number seven. Dennis stumbled upon a man of about 20 years old asleep in the doorway of an unoccupied building along Charing Cross Road. The man was in bad shape and had clearly been living on the streets for a while. He looked underfed and was missing some teeth. Dennis turned on Mr. Nice Guy and offered the fair-skinned man dinner and a warm bed at his home. After the usual ritual, Dennis strangled the man. Dennis later commented how easy this murder was as the young man was in terrible shape from his vulnerable lifestyle. From Alan R. Warren's Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, Nielsen commented that while he was strangling his victim, the man moved his legs in a cycling motion as if he was riding a bicycle, End quote. Murder victim number eight. Sometime between November and December of 1980, Nielsen couldn't recall exactly, Dennis brought his next victim back to 195 Melrose Avenue. Nielsen had been out drinking in the West End of London and met a man on the street after the pubs closed for the night. All Nielsen could recall of this man was that he was between 25 and 30 and that he'd dressed like a bohemian, long hair and loose clothes. Again, he claimed that he couldn't remember anything about the murder itself and wouldn't elaborate any further on this victim. Again, like in the case of Dennis's fifth victim, he later claimed he made the whole thing up. It was around this time that the bodies under the floorboards began to stink and Dennis's neighbors were complaining. 
There were insects everywhere, and even though Dennis pulled up the floorboards daily and used bug spray, he was unable to keep the critters at bay. The cheap deodorizers that Dennis had put into the floorboards with the corpses didn't seem to be doing any good either. He stripped down to his tidy whities and dismembered the bodies. He used a large, purpose-bought pot to boil the flesh from the heads of the victims. He then gathered up the organs and body parts into black plastic bin bags and stuffed them back under the floorboards until he felt safe enough to have another bonfire in the garden. A few of the organs Dennis tossed over a fence that he shared with neighbors and into the bushes on the other side. He later noted with interest that the flesh was almost always gone the next day, probably taken away and consumed by local wild animals, rats and foxes. So we're only at victim number eight. Yeah. And my stomach is already turning. Yeah, well, it should be. It's, um, I don't believe when he's recanting, I don't believe that he's recanting. I think he's, I don't know what he's doing, but I doubt that he would have made it up and then recanted. You know what I mean? I have some ideas on that myself okay. that we'll probably talk about later on after the break that's coming. And it's just, he's just living in squalor. Like, like mm -hmm. his entire life is, it's like an addiction in a way. It is his, fully an addiction. His entire life is like managing the outcomes of what he's doing. Yeah, 100%. Right? And trying to balance and getting rid of bodies. Yeah, it's, it's like an alcoholic going to work. God. Kind of thing. Well, he was an alcoholic yeah. going to work, but there you go. Anyway, murder victim number nine. It was on the fourth of January, nineteen eighty-one, at the Golden Lion Pub in Soho when Nielsen met his next victim. Nielsen said the man couldn't have been more than eighteen years old. He was Scottish and had blue eyes. Dennis recalled the young man's outfit as well: sneakers and a green tracksuit. Nilsson and the man drank for a while until Dennis invited him back to 195 Melrose where they played a drinking game. Dennis, a full-blown alcoholic, easily drank the other man under the table. After his victim passed out, Dennis, who was very drunk himself, supposed he had killed the young man. Supposed. <laughs> he couldn't recall the murder at all and claimed he had also blanked on what he'd done with the body. Murder victim number 10. After yet another night on the prowl, after the pubs had closed in February 1981, Dennis met another Irishman with a Belfast accent, supposedly in his early 20s, and whose name he couldn't remember. As usual, Dennis offered the man drinks and companionship if only he'd come back to his place. The man was slender, around 5 foot 9 inches tall. Again, Dennis couldn't describe the murder and claimed he couldn't recall what he'd done with this young man's body. Nielsen met his 11th victim, at a food stall in Leicester Square in April of 1981. Dennis said the man appeared to be around 20 years old, a skinhead, and reveled in tough talk, telling stories about how he had violently beaten different people. Dennis offered the man some food and drinks back at his flat, and they returned to Nilsson's murder castle in Cricklewood. According to Alan R. Warren's book, quote, Nilsson described a tattoo that the man had on his neck. It said, cut here, end quote. Warren went on to mention that Nilsson claimed he'd hung the man's naked body from the ceiling in his bedroom for the next day, later stuffing it wrapped in black bin liner bags into the floorboards of his home. Again, like victims number five and eight, Nilsson later claimed the man had never existed, that he'd made the whole thing up. There'd be one more killing at 195 Melrose before Dennis Nilsson moved his murderous operation to 23 Cranley Gardens. We'll hear about that and Dennis's final three victims after a quick break. Both of us were sort of taken aback by the fact that he recanted on at least three of these killings. Yeah. And also that he didn't bother to remember their names and all that kind of thing. And I think... I might be way off base, but it, it, I get the sense that the ones that he recanted, he couldn't fantasize enough about to recall them. To so, really remember them. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to do an analogy here. Sure. It's like having a one night stand. Right. With somebody where it wasn't that good. Okay. Um, versus one night stands versus sort of your ideal Okay. Uh, this is kind of, I don't mean to be sick, but. No, um, no, we're, we're, it's, it's a different context. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, like, I've had a lot of, you know, I've 
you know, I've been out there. You've been around. You know, prior prior to Jay, I had lots of one night stands and stuff like that. And obviously I can't remember some of their names, <laughs> right? And when I was drinking and stuff. So maybe this was like, because to him, this is oddly, this yeah. murder is oddly sex, isn't it? Yep. So he's just thinking of, he's just so disgusting. He's thinking of them as like one night stands that don't matter. Right. Although he's killing them. You said he's disgusting. I think he's disgusting too. Some, a couple of listeners came at us about Did they? how we talked about Dennis Nilsson and, and like us making sounds like we're, he's yucky. But you know what? <laughs> he is yucky. Exactly. And that's the tone of the show. And it has been since I he started it five years he's ago. He's a horrible, horrible, horrible subhuman. Yeah. He's, he's disgusting. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> this this is a conversational podcast. This is not us yeah. just telling a story. No. We're going to give our opinions about how we feel about the individuals that we're Nielsen talking. Nielsen is indefensible. He is 100% indefensible. He's a zero. Yeah. Such as zilch, as or Jimmy less, Norton would or say. Or less than. Less than zero. Yeah, yeah. no, because this guy, you know, he had his weirdness, but he wasn't, you know, um, psychologically unable to know that what he was doing was wrong. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong, and he just didn't care to go get help. He didn't care to go get help, and he didn't care enough about the human beings. No. Right? Because it was serving a purpose for him. Yeah. This is the way sexually motivated murder works, mm. is... It's not about, oh, I'm going to fall in love, even though he was weirdly in love with some of the corpses he would claim. But but how can you have a relationship with a, a deceased human being? You cannot. It's an object at that point. Well, of course, there's that lady who thought that she married a ghost. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's a whole different thing. But at that point, the human being is gone. Yeah. It is just the shell that used to contain the human being. Yeah, it's it's it's. An object. I mean, yeah, and I, clearly, I, I he, don't mean it like you know. I mm -hmm. I believe in you know making sure you do totally nice uh, ritualistic Respectful things for, respectfully when yeah. you bury or cremate, but yep. but it's just the body, right? Oh yeah, yeah, Dennis. Dennis, you are a penis. Yeah, we both think Dennis is a penis, and he's gross. Somehow, Nilsson held it together for the next few months. Perhaps his murder spree at the end of 1980 and into the spring of 1981 had satiated his appetite. Or, perhaps more likely, he knew his chances of getting caught were increasing with every kill. But at the end of the summer, the obsession to kill was once again screaming in Nilsson's head. An opportunity presented itself in the form of Malcolm Barlow, whom Dennis found disoriented and leaning up against a wall near Nilsson's home. Nielsen later claimed he felt sorry for the young man. After learning Malcolm was suffering from the side effects of his epilepsy medication, which made him weak and caused him to have trouble standing, Dennis took Malcolm back to his flat at 195 Melrose and called an ambulance for the man who looked much younger than his 23 years. From Alan R. Warren's Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, Born in Rotherham near Sheffield, Barlow suffered from epilepsy from a very early age. His mother died when he was 11, and he was sent to live with his Aunt Doreen. However, she found him to be unmanageable. Barlow was caught stealing, lying, and even sleeping with men in order to blackmail them. Eventually, she kicked him out of her home, and he ended up living in hostels and on welfare, end quote. Malcolm was grateful for Dez's help, so when he was released from the hospital the next day, he went back to Nilsson's flat and knocked on the door to thank him. Dennis wasn't home, so Malcolm decided to wait and sit on the steps for Des to return. When Dennis came home to find Barlow sitting there, he claimed that at first he was irritated, but invited Malcolm back inside for a drink. Malcolm Barlow had no idea what awaited him. To Dennis, Malcolm was a gift. Showing right up on the doorstep. He went and knocked. Dennis wasn't home. He's, and I'm not victim blank. This isn't about victim blank. No, what blaming. he's doing is he's going, somebody really helped me. Right. Uh, what a normal person would do. Probably finish work time. I'm just going to sit here to thank the person. That's exactly. all he was doing. He Ex was actually being a decent human being. Exactly. Yeah. Nielsen and Barlow ate and drank rum together. Malcolm passed out hard on the couch, possibly due to the combination of his epilepsy medication and a lot of booze. Dennis, knowing that he could be connected to Barlow, briefly considered calling another ambulance. However, Nilsson decided he'd take his chances and strangled Malcolm Barlow to death. 
Des then went through his usual ritual of stripping and washing the body and slept with it all night long. The next morning, Nilsson stuffed Malcolm's corpse into a cupboard and casually went to work, just as he had after all the other murders. Nilsson's landlord didn't like him. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Dennis was not surprisingly, to all accounts, a bit of a prick and mm -hmm. hard to deal with when it came to business. A BTK was like that too, just yeah. a real arsehole. Okay. The landlord decided that the best way to be rid of this problematic tenant was to renovate. Dennis accepted the thousand pounds he was offered to vacate and began to prepare for his move to 23 Cranley Gardens, his last residence prior to his capture. Part of the prep was another large bonfire in the back garden on the day before he moved. To ensure that nothing in the ash pile was recognizable as human remains, Dennis went through it with a rake. Dennis Nilsson moved into his attic flat at 23D Cranley Gardens in the Muswell Hill District of North London on the 5th of October, 1981. He was not overjoyed with the place. It didn't have the private back garden that his Melrose flat had, but it would have to suffice. It didn't take Dennis long before he was luring potential victims to his new lair. He didn't think that through very well, did he? Didn't think what through? If you're moving into an attic flat with no garden, mm -hmm. and you have a penchant for murdering people, yep. it's going to be much harder to get rid of the bodies. Well, maybe this was his geographical cure. You know, maybe oh, he... maybe, yeah, but wherever you go, there you are. That's the problem. For those who aren't aware of what that is, essentially, as an alcoholic, we'll do things to set ourselves up to not drink. Okay, if I do this, I probably won't get drunk. Including moving somewhere else. Including moving somewhere else. So it could have been what was going on in his mind. If I move into this attic flat where everybody will hear me coming and going, I'm less likely to murder people. Maybe. It could have been that. Yeah. Nilsson decided to give himself a birthday gift. On the 23rd of November, 1981... Nilsson coaxed a 19-year-old gay student named Paul Nobbs to his home for drinks. Then they went to bed together, and Nobbs later passed out. The young man woke up at 2.30 a.m. in the morning with a pounding headache but went back to sleep. He woke again at around 6 a.m. and went into the kitchen. In the mirror there, he saw a deep red mark across his throat. The whites of his eyes were bloodshot, petechial hemorrhaging, and his face looked bruised and bloated. Nilsson walked into the kitchen, saw Nobbs looking at himself in the mirror and said Paul looked terrible and might consider seeing a doctor. Nobbs took Dez's advice and went to the university and infirmary the same day. Medical staff there told Paul that it looked as though he'd been strangled. He decided not to report the incident until he saw Nilsson's mugshot in the news more than a year later. Wow, that's a lucky getaway. On New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1981, Dennis Nielsen's neighbors heard Dennis Nielsen leave and then come back with someone. It was soon after that that they heard a commotion, crashing and banging and raised voices coming from Dennis's flat. There was the sound of footsteps running down the stairs and then the sound of a man sobbing as he ran out the door, slamming it after him. The man had been Toshimitsu Ozawa, a Japanese chef who Dennis had invited back to 23 Cranley Gardens for a drink. Ozawa fled when Dennis came at him with an outstretched necktie. Ozawa reported the incident to police, but they did not follow up. Of course. I'm really glad that most serial killers that I look at, mm -hmm. well, the gay serial killers, I like so not my type. <laughs> Okay. Like, like I just, I look at, because there are three big ones in London, and I'm like, yeah, would never have gone home with any of them, because they're not my type. So I'm like, I'm, thank God I have good taste, Mike. Thank God I have good taste. Well, I have crappy taste, because I would have totally <laughs> gone home with Dennis Nielsen. And it wasn't a taste thing, it was just like... Music and booze. Music and booze, I'm in, yeah. count me in. Yeah. In January of 1982, while drinking at a pub in Leicester Square, Nielsen met the man he called John the Guardsman later identified as 23-year-old John Howlett from High Wycombe, from Alan R. Warren's Drinks, Dinner, and Death. Quote, Howlett was 5 foot 10 inches tall with a very toned body. Howlett left home while he was still a teenager. He found a job with a carnival and traveled the country and worked at different fairs. At the pub, the two men drank most of the night, but when Nilsson invited Howlett back to his place, he said he had to go because he had an early morning. End quote. A month later, in March, the two men met up again at the same pub. 
This time it was Howlett that approached Nielsen. He remembered him from his last visit in January. The two men talked and drank together before Nielsen invited Howlett back to his apartment for dinner. End quote. Nielsen claimed that after drinks, a movie, and a brief sexual encounter, he'd asked Howlett to leave, but he'd refused. Howlett, Nielsen said, was not his type. Dennis then used a length of loose upholstery strap on an armchair to strangle John. But the young man, larger and more fit than Dennis's usual prey, put up quite a fight. Dennis thought the man might best him, so he bashed John's head hard on the headboard of the bed. From Nielsen's later confession, quote, Summoning up all of my strength, I forced him back down, and his head struck the rim of the headrest on the bed. He struggled fiercely so that now he was half off the bed. In about a minute, he had gone limp. There was blood on the bed. I assumed it was from his head. I checked, and he was still breathing, deep, rasping breaths. I tightened my grip on him, again around his neck for another minute or so. I let go my grip again, and he appeared to be dead. I stood up. The dog was barking in the next room, so I went to pacify it. I was shaking all over with the stress of the struggle. I really thought he was going to get the better of me. I returned and was shocked to see that he had started breathing again. I looped the material around his neck again, pulled it as tight as I could, and held him for what must have been two or three minutes. When I released my grip, he had finally stopped breathing. End quote. Before we go on, I want to point out the fact that Dennis took the time away from this human being who he was strangling to go make sure his dog was okay. Mm. You know? Well, okay, or like not riling the neighbors to come over right. as well. Perhaps, right? yeah, yeah, perhaps that's all it was. John started breathing again, however. Nilsson, annoyed, bruised, and scratched from his fight with Howlett, dragged the man's body into the bathroom, filled the tub with water, and held Howlett's head under the water for a few minutes to ensure that he was dead. Oh, no. I really wanted him to... Live? Yeah. Yeah. And, d- and bash him in the face and get the police and get this, all, this guy off the street. It did not oh, happen so that way. Sad. As he had not been attracted to John Howlett... After coming home from work, the next day, Dennis set about trying to dispose of John's corpse. He took it out of the cupboard where he'd stored it and dragged it to the bathroom where he covered the floor with plastic bags. He dismembered the body, dissected the flesh, and began disposing of it bit by bit, flushing it down the loo. According to Alan R. Warren in Dinner, Drinks, and Death, quote, The process was taking hours, so Nielsen thought it might be quicker to boil the flesh down to a soup-like mixture. It would also make it a lot easier to flush down the toilet, avoiding any backups or overflows. When the head was cooked enough, he scooped out the brains and flushed them as well. The larger bones and parts that were firm were wrapped up in plastic bags. He laid those out on the floor, packed them with salt, and left them for the garbage man to pick up. Nilsen kept a few of the larger pieces. He thought the garbage man might not take all of them, and questions might arise, end quote. Holy jeez. It's just so gruesome. It's gruesome and grim. Dennis Nilsson's next potential murder victim survived his attack, but was never quite the same afterward. Carl Stodder was a 21-year-old drag artist whom Nilsson invited to 23 Cranley Gardens for a drink in April of 1982. Nilsson chose his targets carefully. He noticed Carl sitting at the bar, looking downtrodden. Dennis sat down beside him and struck up a conversation as always playing the nice guy feigning concern. Carl fell for the ruse and confided in Dez, telling him all about a boyfriend who'd been abusing him. Already quite drunk, they returned to Nilsson's flat where Nilsson tucked Carl into a sleeping bag where he fell asleep. Carl woke with Dennis on top of him, trying to strangle him with the zipper from the sleeping bag. In 2010, Carl Stoddard told the Sun newspaper, quote, Nilsson was behind me, kneeing me in the back and telling me to keep still. No air was going into my lungs and all I could feel was the teeth of the zip digging into my neck as he pulled it tighter. I briefly felt blood from the wound trickling over my skin and then passed out, End quote. Stodder came to and heard water running into the tub in the bathroom. Nilsen dragged the dazed man to the tub where he attempted to drown Carl, holding his head under the water for prolonged periods. Carl passed out again. Nilsen... Thinking Carl was dead, stripped him and propped him in the easy chair he'd used to pose his other victims. 
After the dog began licking him, Nilsson saw that Carl was breathing and took him to bed, apologizing to him. When Carl asked what happened, Nilsson explained away the scrapes and cuts that Stodder had on his neck. Nilsson said that he'd been thrashing about in the sleeping bag, having a nightmare and had cut himself. He'd put him in the water to, quote, revive him. Over the next torturous two days, Stodder stayed with Nilsson as he got his strength back. Dennis then helped him to the train station and told Carl he hoped they'd get together again soon. Even as confused as he was, Carl knew he'd gotten away by the skin of his teeth. From Drinks, Dinner, and Death, quote, Stoddard got off the train and went directly to the hospital, where he was treated for burst blood vessels in his face, water in his lungs, and several cuts on his neck. It was about two weeks before Stoddard went to the police. He claimed, back then, the police would just sweep the gay thing under the carpets. End quote. The man changed his name, saying Carl Stoddard had died at 23 Cranley Gardens that night. Oh, that's sad. It is very sad. I wonder if he changed his drag name as well. I don't know. Dennis Nilsson's penultimate murder victim, Archibald Graham Allen, who went by Graham, was a Scotsman, a father, and had been born in Glasgow. Allen's son Shane gives a brief description of his father on his blog, published years later. Quote, My father, Graham Archibald Allen, was born on the 31st of October 1954 in Motherwell, Scotland, he was a healthy, athletic child raised in a stable home by two strict Protestant parents. The youngest of two, he grew with attention problems and failed miserably at school. The only thing he excelled at was football, at the age of 14, making Motherwell's youth team. But Motherwell, not even the promise of professional football, could contain my father. By the age of 15, he had discovered Glasgow, alcohol, and cheap prescription drugs. By 17, he was out of school, out of pocket, out of home. Having been laid off by the steelworkers in Motherwell and with nothing else for it, he made his way down south to London. It was there, ten years later, that Graham Allen would one night meet another fellow Scot by the name of Dennis Andrew Nielsen. End quote. Allen was yet another vulnerable person taken from the world by Dennis Nielsen. Alan was a heroin addict and petty thief, stealing from businesses and people to feed the monkey on his back. The night he disappeared, he told his girlfriend Leslie that he was going to get money for dope and would probably roll a gay man for the cash. It wasn't the first time he'd been down that road. Dennis saw Alan trying to hail a cab in Piccadilly Circus and asked the driver to pick the man up. Alan hopped into the cab with Nilsson and they chatted. Nilsson invited Alan back to 23 Cranley Gardens for a drink and dinner and Alan accepted. The story Nilsson told of how Alan died is odd, and in all likelihood a big fat lie concocted by Nilsson to posthumously shame his victim. Dennis said they drank as he made omelets for them. Dennis claimed that Graham Allen choked on an omelet as he passed out, and Nilsson simply watched him die thinking the whole scene ridiculous. More than likely, Alan was treated in the exact same way that all the other victims were, strangled, drowned, washed, toyed with, and stuffed in a closet before dismemberment, dissection, and disposal. Shane Levine, the son of Graham Allen, recalled on his blog, Memories of a Heroin Head, the moment everything changed for he and his mother. Quote, It all started with a scream. I heard it from the top of the road as I made my way home from school. Somehow, I knew it was my mother's pain. It was a scream from nowhere and of unbearable suffering. And it didn't stop. It was 1983 and my mother had just been informed that her lover, my father, missing for over a year, had been discovered, murdered and dismembered and stuffed in two black bin bags in the flat of serial killer Dennis Nilsson. It was an event that would blow lives apart. I was seven and hell was on its way, end quote. Shane continued, My mother had a breakdown and turned to alcohol. I turned to solitude, vandalism, and violence. At the age of 13, the educational system gave up on me. At 14, I started smoking weed, and by 15, I was using LSD and speed. At 17, I tried a heroin substitute, and it forever changed my life. By the age of 24, I was a heroin and crack addict, and one year later, I was injecting. End quote. You see, the person murdered is never the only victim. Absolutely not. But it sounds like he, um, I'm glad to see that he has memories of a heroin head 
Yeah. It sounds like he's got his act together, which is great. Hopefully he is, is a, a sober person. Yeah, today. yeah. that's great. If, if he's out there, hey, we're rooting for you. Nielsen went on to kill Stephen Sinclair, who we mentioned in our first episode. And soon after that, thanks to the keen eye of a couple of cops and dino rod plumbing engineers, Dennis Andrew Nielsen was captured and brought to justice. Dennis Andrew Nielsen was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life behind bars. Sure, Dennis Nielsen wrote and would bang on seemingly without end about his murders, but was he telling the truth at all or merely reliving his crimes, romanticizing them, while fueling his inner fantasies and re-victimizing these people? Mm. In HMP Full Sutton Prison, as well as spending lots of time writing, sometimes to his surviving victims and the families of the ones whom he'd successfully killed, Dennis also learned to play many of his favorite tunes on his own personal keyboard. In 2011, the man formerly known as Carl Stodder vented his anger at Nilsson's winning £55,000 to take his case to European Court of Human Rights in a bid to seek permission to write a tell-all book about his crimes. Stodder said, quote, Why should he have his human rights when his victims haven't any? It's not justice. This happened to be 29 years ago, and I never forgot it. End quote. Carl Stoddard died in 2020. Ultimately, Nielsen's biography was not published until 2021, three years after his own death. And speaking of Dennis Nielsen's death, Dennis Andrew Nielsen died in prison on May 12, 2018. According to the BBC, he was taken to hospital in York two days before, suffering with abdominal pains, Hull's coroner's court heard. The 72-year-old, who spent 34 years behind bars, underwent an operation but later suffered a blood clot. Coroner's officer Gary Lynch said Nilsson, who was born in Fraserburgh, Aberdeenshire, died on 12 May after his condition deteriorated. A post-mortem examination showed the murderer's immediate cause of death was pulmonary embolism and retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Mr. Lynch said the underlying cause of this was deep vein thrombosis and a, quote, abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture repair. In another BBC article, it was noted that Dennis Nielsen died in, quote, excruciating pain and that he, quote, spent his final hours laying in his own filth as he suffered a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, end quote. Dennis Nilsson's ashes went to a man named Mark Austin, who developed a relationship as a pen pal with Nilsson over a number of years, from mirror.co.uk. Quote, Mark, who is a graphic designer from Bedfordshire, has kept the ashes in his front room ever since. He will scatter them in Nilsson's hometown of Fraserburg, Scotland, next month. I know people in Fraserburg won't be happy with it, and it will cause a fuss, but it was Des's birthplace, and he was a human being, Mark said. I think the sea in Fraserburg is the best place. Des loved the sea. I think it's what he would have wanted. It's going to be closure and the end to it all. End quote. Mark, Mark, Mark. Yeah. What about, what about closure for all those people that right. killed? Dennis was a human being. He was. After all, he was. However. However, come on. You're like, you start a pen pal with somebody in jail and then you do an interview in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Attention-seeking twat. Okay, fair enough. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 229, Lonely Monster, Serial Killer Dennis Nielsen, part three. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or one 327 5786 or 1-877-D-A-R-K-P-T-N. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Okay, here's our first voicemail. Hey, Mike. It's uh, Casper Powell calling. I just wanted to let you know that I'm in uh, beautiful Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. I got sick and tired of looking at uh, Matt's old uh, neighborhood since I lived there. <laughs> Uh, just thought I would uh, check out your hometown for this. this be the second trip out here for me. Uh, I worked out here a couple of years ago. Uh, it's just as beautiful as I remember. And uh, just having a great time out here with uh, my riding crew. Uh, we uh, 
rode motorcycles all the way out here, did the Cabot Trail, and uh, just loving this province. It's absolutely gorgeous. So wash them toques and pour some maple syrup in there, eh? <laughs> and P.S. Matt uh, Valerie uh, says to uh, check your messages. She sent you one a while ago. Thanks. <laughs> Love the podcast. Have a good one. Beep. <laughs> That's really funny. I actually saw the message this morning. Okay. <laughs> by chance. I'm really bad at, um, even though I'm very good at posting memes on Facebook, yeah. I'm very bad at keeping up with the messages. Me too. And and Valerie was like, oh, you, you must have got the voicemail. And I didn't know what she was talking about. So, so, so Valerie, officially, I actually saw your message before I heard that. Before I heard that. So. Oh, that's funny. Hope you have a good time out there, Casper. Yeah, th that's really cool. I, lo I love the idea of riding motorcycles across the country. It reminds me of uh, Easy Rider. Easy Rider. Uh, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson movie. Enjoy your time in NS and make sure you have yourself a lobster roll. Perhaps in Chester, I think there's a little restaurant in Chester, Nova Scotia, along the uh, number three highway where you can get a really good lobster roll. So you might want to do that. It's uh, it's amazing. <laughs> anyway. It makes it official. To, you, should, you should get some. Um, or as we say in Nova Scotia, it's some good you. We, sh we should get the Atlantic provinces to uh, sponsor the show. I totally would do it. Or Southwestern Ontario. Yeah. Because, hey. Matthew, every bloody story you've written other than Frank Lloyd Wright is about Sowesto. And one's coming up. So we have to talk about that. Yeah, next week. Cool. But uh, yeah, if you're, <laughs> I'm going to put a moratorium on Southwestern They're Ontario. They're good stories. I know they are, but there's other places in Canada. Yeah, but that's where the majority of the population lives. And all the cool kids. Don't you get me started on that one. And, all the, and all the cool kids. You just <laughs> lost us listeners, I'm, buddy. You know, I'm just teasing. Absolutely. Holy smokes. I know. I'm actually, there's one that takes place here that I'm doing after the after next week. Yeah, that one's kind of fun too. Yeah, well, fun, but not fun. But, not fun, but, but interesting. Sad, yeah. yeah. Like when I say an episode is fun, it means it's intense and it took a lot of yeah. interesting thinking around it yeah. and like... Yeah. It's not because it's an actual fun thing. <laughs> Yay, murder, fun! Yeah, murder is so fun. No, it's not. Um, all right. Let's listen to our next voicemail. I haven't pre-listened to this, so we're in for it. Uh-oh. Bonjour from Montreal. Thank you for covering cases from Quebec. It's extremely creepy to learn the story from places so near me. Last summer, I was listening to episode 177, the Jacques Cartier Bridge murders, while coincidentally being on a park extremely nearby. It really spooked me to learn that mere meters away, people lost their lives so horribly. I also really love how you pronounce Longueuil. Again, thank you for bringing okay. those stories to so many people. Continue your good work and set the cat velvet chapeau. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, I love it. We need another Quebec one sometimes. Yeah, we do. And I, I think you have to fly me out there to do research. Well, why don't you just do the research when you fly there uh, for your business? Oh, I haven't gone for a long time. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I love the Quebec. I love the Quebec. See, the, the issue with doing uh, cases from Quebec is I am not the best French speaker or reader, so I have to put things through translation, and the translation software is terrible. Okay. What we should do is like call up a French listener and go, "Hey, need your help? Need your help? <laughs> Can you? Yeah, maybe we should hire somebody who translates. If if we'll pay you in stickers, I liked her pronunciation of it. Long gay, long gay, long gay. Oh, long gay. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> Matthew likes himself a long gay. Uh, dear. Uh, Where to next? Uh, I. <laughs> well, that's it. That's it for voicemails. I'm just sort of... Uh, Taking that in? Yeah, I'm flailing a little. <laughs> that's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. I guess this is the part of the show where we do the Patreon shoutouts. Okay. Yeah, we'll do Patreon first. 
and then do donut money if there is any after. Excellent. So first up from Rosenberg, Texas. That was the name of my psychiatrist, Dr. Rosenberg. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, it really was. Did you get your money back? Uh, (laughs) No, I lied to him a lot. (laughs) That's so funny. People go to there, shrink and lie. That's going to be really helpful. Yeah, it was so dumb. Why would I do that? But anyway, um, Michael Gibson is from Rosenberg, Texas. Michael Gibson. And so what does Michael Gibson do in Rosenberg, Texas? Well, I have a friend named Michael Gibson Mm -hmm. who's a creative director, so I'm going to say all Michael Gibsons are creative directors. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. We do know another Michael Gibson, and he is... A creative director. No, he's Mike Gibson from the podcast True Crime All the Time. Sort of creative. Yeah. I don't think Michael Gibson from that podcast is from Rosenberg, Texas, though. I, I might be wrong. Okay. So maybe this is him. I don't know. Maybe it's him. It's either a creative director or a podcast host. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you so much, Michael Gibson. There in Rosenberg, <laughs> where people lie to their shrinks. Yeah. Yeah. Gibby, as he is called uh, on the show... He's you. Oh, he's the you. He's the you on that show. Oh, my show. aunt is obsessed with Gibby. Yeah, he's a nice fella. Yeah. I got a picture of with him with my, with my aunt for my aunt. Oh, cool. Yeah. He's a good guy. Next up we have Trisha Kevaranian. Trisha Kevaranian. And I don't know where Trisha is from, Matthew. So we're gonna figure it out. Matthew's uh he's got the uh, She's fr- she, the special hat on. She's from Stoner, British Columbia. Stoner. Yep. And what does she do in Stoner? She just kick kicks back and smokes the doobies. Well, I hope she's not offended by that. But good for you if it's if you're not. Well, she wouldn't be offended. It's uh, it's uh. She's from Stoner. She's from Stoner. <laughs> there you go. Okay, great. And if she's not, then oh, she goes to other happy places. Exactly. Next, we have Jackie Paulson. Jackie Paulson, and she is from Canby, Minnesota. Okay. Canby, Minnesota. I do believe that is Minnesota. (laughs) I have to make sure. Canby, Minnesota. Uh, Yep, I was correct. Okay, look at you knowing (laughs) where Canby is. (laughs) Well. Wow. Yep. But uh, yeah, so Canby, Minnesota. And what does Jackie do in Canby? She's a waitress at the Old Spaghetti Factory. <laughs> there you go. I love the Old Spaghetti Factory. You would. You know the one in Gastown is haunted, right? Yeah, from people that died from bad spaghetti. <laughs> Come on now. It's not that I've bad. I've never been. It's actually pretty good. Is it? It is actually. Let's go sometime. Yeah, we'll go. Okay. Well, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> oh, dear. And, uh, oh, yes, I forgot to mention... We had a friend of the show, longtime friend of the show, <gasps> who has upped their pledge. Yay! And from RG Bargy. Yeah, RG. <laughs> Thank you, RG Bargy. We love friend. you. We, the reason we call you RG Bargy is because we cannot pronounce, <laughs> can't pronounce your, your name. Well, no, I've always called her RG Bargy. R-E-H, or yeah. But anyway. Uh, so she edited her pledge from five dollars to twenty five bucks. So it makes her a prime minister. Yay! She's now a PM. Pr- prime minister, of ladies Dark and Poutine. gentlemen, prime minister RG Bargy. There you go. Uh, la- that's it for patrons this week. We love the RG Bargy. We we do. Next, we have to look. Oh, I misspelled the word PayPal. Did you? Yeah, yeah, because it's so difficult to spell. <laughs> Would you put pay friend in? No, I forgot oh. a P. It's payal. 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 <laughs> payal. That's what uh, Alan Warren wants for his books. Payal. Payal. Okay. Here we go. And it doesn't look like we have any patrons uh, for donut money this week, but whatever. We're not sad. Uh, I I would love some. Donut money to spend in the, in the UK, perhaps that might be fun, because uh, fish and chip money. Fish and chip money. I guess that's what it would be over there. What's the treat? What's a treat in the UK? Like fried Mars bar? No, that's only in Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. What did we have for treats? Uh, I don't know. A flake. 
the flake chocolate well, yeah, bar. Yeah, chocolate Cadbury flake and stuff y- yeah, like that. Yeah, those kind of things. It's not really a big donut city, though. No, that's fine. But there are donuts and cakes there. I just yeah. need to be careful that the cakes aren't boozy. That's all. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for Patreon and Donut Money donors. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. Uh, Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Danish buns. Danish buns. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye. (laughs) Bye.